Just as they do now, many people in the Middle Ages journeyed for business, pleasure, and religious reasons. But unlike today, people had just two options when travelling in the medieval world. They could go either by land, or they could go by sea. Those who could afford it rode on horseback or on a donkey. These are some of the land options, by the way. Produce was transported by pack animal or on carts and carriages. Across Europe, the Romans were responsible for building a network of roads and bridges throughout their empire. These highways were first built for military purposes, but they became vital for trade. Sadly, after the fall of Rome at the beginning of the 5th century, these roads were no longer maintained and reverted back into dirt tracks. For the majority of people, the only way to get from A to B was on foot, and in truth, road travel during the Middle Ages was horrendous. Let's travel back in time and take a look at why. Welcome to Medieval Madness. My feet are killing me. Distances of between 10 and 20 miles could be covered in a day, further if the need was urgent and the road was better maintained. Driven on by religious fervour, pilgrims might even cover 30 miles in a day, meaning that they would spend somewhere between 8 and 10 hours just walking. Being a fundamental part of medieval society, Christianity saturated the lives of medieval people in Europe. For them, their faith was a physical thing that could be recognised in the great cathedrals and abbeys that they built, and the relics that they could see at various shrines throughout the lands. The church encouraged the people to make special pilgrimages to these holy sites, where they would find the teeth, bones, shoes, or other items that once belonged to an important saint. Praying at one of these shrines would offer redemption and a better chance of going to heaven. Many shrines even gave hope for a cure from illness or disability. At Canterbury Cathedral, a pilgrim could buy a vial of Thomas Becket's blood, said to cure epilepsy, blindness, and leprosy. Whereas at Walsingham, a small flask was said to contain the milk of the Virgin Mary, and I've heard her bathwaters on eBay. The most common relics were nails and pieces of wood said to come from the cross used for the crucifixion of Christ. And many of these relics were duplicated throughout Europe. In fact, by the end of the Middle Ages, the French theologian John Calvin said that because so many churches maintained that they possessed a piece of the true cross, that there was enough wood in them to, quote, make a big shipload. Of course, money was involved and would be collected when a pilgrim arrived at the shrine. Some would pay extra so that they could touch or even kiss the holy relic. Usually, the shrine keeper would reward them with a metal badge stamped with the shrine's symbol. That way the pilgrim could fix it to their hat to let everyone know what shrines they had visited, the medieval equivalent of having a lot of stamps in your passport. Some travelled overseas by land and boat to visit holy places such as Palestine, where a cave supposedly contained the bed of Adam and Eve. Any journey in the Middle Ages was dangerous, especially a long one, so pilgrims travelled in groups for safety against outlaws, or if they were wealthy enough, they would pay someone else to go on a pilgrimage for them, such as the London merchant who paid a man £20 to go to Mount Sinai in Egypt for him in 1352. All roads lead to somewhere. Finding your way could be tricky, as many roads weren't signposted, as not a lot of people could read. Most people stayed within their local area and didn't travel very far, so they relied on their memory to know where to go. For journeys further afield, a guide could be hired. Most medieval cities didn't have a planned layout as they grew organically, and although many would have paved their inner streets, not all of the roads in the locality of the city would also have been surfaced. Roads would be so thick with mud that they would be deemed totally impassable, meaning that any unlucky traveller who was transporting his goods would need to roll his cargo around the obstacle, even if it meant trapezing through some poor farmer's field and destroying his crops or ending up stuck. Wooden planks and stones were often left at the side of roads to cover over any muddy parts and create some sort of purchase for the horse's hooves, but these were sometimes stolen by robbers hoping to catch their victims out and steal from them when they were stuck in the mud and vulnerable. The routes between many cities were impassable during the winter months, and although the wheels of a wagon turned easily in the summer, there was still the sweltering sun and the choking dust to contend with. By the 9th century, the Moors had created a widespread network of streets in Cordoba, Spain. In Western Europe, by the 12th century, old cities were being restored and new ones were being built. 
By the 1400s, these cities were served by better maintained roads which brought produce from the surrounding localities. Although in other parts of the world, such as the Inca Empire of South America, a complex network of roads was constructed, radiating out from the capital city of Cusco. From Quito in Ecuador through Peru to Santiago in Chile, two parallel highways, one following the coast and the other the Andes, spanned the empire. Altogether, this network covered 750,000 square miles of land, with 14,000 miles of road. Are we there yet? Anyone who could afford to either buy or rent a horse could travel on horseback. Of course, much longer distances could then be covered. These mounted riders would often have a valet who walked beside them leading a separate pack horse laden with their master's belongings. Long journeys could take weeks or even months, and often meant staying overnight somewhere en route. A small set of metal bells, called crotal bells, were hung either from the horse's harness or somewhere on the rider's belt, and would make a noise as the rider travelled along. This would warn pedestrians to get out of the way. Those with enough money could travel in a litter, which was a carriage-like box held up by two poles and attached to four horses, two at the front and two behind. The horses were trained to walk at the same speed. Both open wagons and covered coaches were used to transport people and goods. Wagons would have either two or four wheels and would be pulled by horses or oxen, which were much slower. Some vehicles were open to the elements, others had a fabric cover held up with arched branches, and the most luxurious would have a wooden structure with doors. Although all were without the modern luxury of spring suspension, and were bumpy and extremely uncomfortable regardless. Even short journeys took much longer than expected. In the late 13th century, the Duchess of Brabant, daughter of King Edward I of England, was newly married. Not wanting to leave her clothing behind, it was decided that she would move her complete collection from London to Ipswich, a journey of around 85 miles. Laden down with her outfits, it took the cart 18 days to arrive, even with five horses pulling. For contrast, you can do this journey in about an hour on the train nowadays. Travelling could prove to be an expensive business, inns would only provide food and lodging for a fee. And a horse, just like a car does today, required maintenance and would on occasion break down. Your horse needed to be stabled, fed and shooed, and tack had to be bought. Extra expensive for the medieval traveller included making offerings to churches along the way and giving charitable donation to almshouses. Inclement weather such as heavy rain or snow could cause major delays to travel, meaning that extra money for lodging was needed. All at sea. Transportation by sea flourished in the Middle Ages, and there was an increase in both trade and travel throughout the world. Merchants who dealt in all manner of produce were able to take advantage of this and ship more goods to foreign markets. The Vikings were famous for using longboats from the 10th century for transportation, trade and warfare. Long distances could be covered in these boats. In fact, the Viking adventurer Leif Erikson reached the coast of North America from Europe at the beginning of the 11th century and named the area Vinland. The Vikings also used a merchant ship known as a Nar. It was shorter, wider, and deeper than a longboat, meaning that it could carry more cargo for trades such as wool, timber, furs, weapons, and slaves. Trading took place along routes in the Mediterranean and Baltic seas, amongst others. Nars were able to cross the Atlantic to Vinland, Greenland, and Iceland to carry livestock to Norse settlements. Further south, galleys, which were propelled along by rowers, remained in use throughout the period. They were also used in Northern Europe, but to a lesser degree, as they weren't stable enough for rough waters. As we reach the High Middle Ages, a one-masted ship known as a cog gradually replaced the Viking ships. Its flat-bottomed hull made it perfect for loading and unloading as the cog could settle on a level in the harbour. By the late period, shipbuilding had become far more advanced. By then, Carrick and Caravel ships were often used. The Caravel was small, easy to control, and swift, having a lateen sail. The larger carrack had three to four masts, and was stable enough for stormy seas and long voyages. Columbus used two caravels named Nina and Piñata for his voyage to the Indies in 1492, as well as a larger carrack named the Santa Maria. In Venice, a city built on water, gondolas were in use from the early Middle Ages, although the aristocracy preferred to travel on horseback rather than boat. After the riding of horses was banned in the 14th century, the Italian elite took to riding in gondolas along its canals instead, and this mode of transport is still used by tourists today. After the arrival of the Black Death, and because of its subsequent outbreaks, in 1403, Venice quarantined ships on an island called Lazaretto, where passengers had to wait 40 days before being allowed into the city. 
Despite these precautions, by 1748, Venice had been struck by plague 48 times. William Way, a 15th century English scholar, gave tips for travelling on a pilgrimage by sea to Jaffa in the Holy Land from Venice. He recommended staying safe by making a contract with the ship's captain in the presence of witnesses before boarding the ship, and taking extra food for the journey as well as laxatives and candles. He advised finding a galley place, quote, on the highest deck because the lowest is smouldering hot and stinking. He warned that a good place would cost, quote, 40 ducats for the galley, meat and drink to Jaffa and back to Venice. He also informed any would-be pilgrims to buy a small chamber pot in Venice because, quote, if you become ill and are unable to climb to the upper parts, you will be able to do what you have to in it. It seems that journeys may have been slower in the Middle Ages, but then, just as now, affordability, not getting ripped off, quarantining and not catching a virus abroad were at the forefront of the medieval traveller's mind. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Do hope you've enjoyed it, and please do subscribe if you enjoy the content. For those of you joining us as this video goes live, I hope you all have a fantastic New Year's. Cheers!